Greetings, gardeners, and welcome to a Gardening Simplified Extra. We have been getting so many questions from listeners, and we thank everyone who has written in, and we wanted to take the time to devote an entire episode just to answering questions. So uh, this is only going to appear, of course, on YouTube and our podcast, and we're going to be covering questions from listeners over the past couple of months. If you have a question for the Gardening Simplified show, we are always happy to help. You can email us at help, H-E-L-P, at gardeningsimplifiedonair.com or just visit gardeningsimplifiedonair.com. There's a contact form. Either way, it will reach us. You can attach a photo so you can uh, give us more context, which is always important, even though those questions are a little difficult to answer, of course, on air. Uh, And so we've put together some questions that we think are timely and interesting. And uh, without further ado, uh, let's get started with the first question, which is from Steve and Mary. They say, after listening to your show on Center Stage Red Crepe Myrtle, we'd like to get one. However, we see that they do better in zones seven through nine, which in Michigan, we are in zone five. Let us know if this myrtle would work for us. It is beautiful. I feel Stephen and Mary's pain having lived in Zone 5 Michigan for years. <laughs> yeah, Zone 5 is, you know, at least it's not Zone 4. Because Zone 4 is, you a lot of stuff drops off after Zone 5. Like, you're, that's kind of like, I don't want to say you can't grow anything interesting in Zone 4. But if much below Zone 5, your, your options get limited. You know, it, makes, uh, it brings up a good point, though. And that is uh, living in that zone, March, April. Uh, what a great time to wander out in the landscape, start to look for some swelling buds on the hydrangeas, the lilacs, crepe myrtle, whatever it may be, and try to determine the uh, amount of dieback that you've had the past winter because every year is different, Stacy. It's true. There's so many factors. You know, people think it's just a matter of how cold the winter got. But the fact is, there are many factors. It's it's how rainy was the fall? Was yep. the fall favorable yep. uh, to growth? Um, and in spring, does spring come? Does spring come early? Does spring come late? But you know, overall, I always encourage, and I'm sure you do too, Rick, uh, uh, taking an experimental approach to gardening. I think that's one of the most fun things that you can do is to not necessarily take it so rigid and just say okay, this plant's beautiful, but I can't grow it. Now there's certain things like, obviously I'm not going to be able to grow an avocado in my yard here in Michigan. That would be pushing it too far. But the fact is that when it comes to crepe myrtles, they are actually hardy than has hardier than has long been believed that they actually are. I agree. I I like to take the Alexander Hamilton approach and take my shot. (laughs) I really do. I agree with what you just said. Why not? Yeah. So um, I think for years, because crepe myrtles did so well in the South, people just assumed they were Southern plants. And then people started saying, well, you know what? Hey, I like this. I'm going to give it a try. And it has really increased everybody's understanding or, or sort of assumptions about what a crepe myrtle will do. So I don't know where in Michigan you, uh, you actually are. I can say without question here on the west side of Michigan around the lakeshore, we can easily grow crepe myrtle without a problem. Yes. It does very often die back to the ground. Not every year, but it often does. But it will come right back from the roots and it will still flower. They flower on new wood. So they spend the season growing back, and then those flowers start to appear in August. Now, what you end up with, rather than the beautiful sculptural uh, tree-like crepe myrtles that you see in the South, is something that's going to be more multi-stemmed, shrubbier, smaller, but you are going to get that great color. So we have excellent success with overwintering uh, center stage red crepe myrtle here in Grand Haven. Um, if you want to try it, I have a couple pieces of advice, and this is true for not just any for center stage red, but anytime you're pushing the hardiness zone of something you want to experiment with it, that is start, plant it in spring. These are not plants that you want to plant in fall because they're not going to have enough time to develop a good root system, just like we were talking about in uh, this week's show, uh, Gardening Simplified show. You want them to be have as long a possible time to develop a good root system that's going to help them withstand all of the challenges that winter is going to throw at them. So these are definitely plants that you're going to want to plant in spring and not fall. And uh, you want to choose a protected spot. 
Sure. So this is not going to be something that you're going to put, you know, in the middle of your yard where it's completely exposed. You're going to want to try to find something that is protected, especially from the West, where, you know, the direction of most of our coldest weather is moving in from. Like if you have a, a spot in your house where maybe two walls come together and create that little kind of nook, those are good locations. If you have a courtyard, sure, that's a good location. And mulch, mulch, mulch. Very important establishing that foundation, uh, microclimates. We often refer to them as microclimates. And what does microclimate mean here in Michigan? It means, like you said, Stacy, don't put that plant right out in the middle of the yard or plant it by the road. Right. Put it in a microclimate. And in a more protected spot, if you can snuggle it up against your house. Um, and, you know, a lot of times, too, if you're really concerned about it, they sell a variety of, like, frost blankets and plant protectors online sure. that you can use for those first couple of years because the more established a plant gets, the better it's able to withstand, uh, very often, those challenges of the cold. So, again, without knowing where exactly you are in Michigan, you know, I wouldn't even say, oh, if you're in the UP, it's out because I think if you're in the Marquette in Marquette or somewhere, you know, along the coast of Michigan and you have that slightly mild climate because of the lake you can almost certainly be successful you're probably your least success would be like in smack in the middle of of michigan yeah. where it's you know you're far away from all of those mitigating sure. factors but if you can find one it's always worth a try because the worst that's going to happen is you're going to learn something Stephen and mary take your shot and uh by the way stacy with the crepe myrtle what was the proven winner's color choice shrub variety again uh, that was center stage red which is a black leaf crepe myrtle with red flowers and it is absolutely gorgeous so i can't blame anyone for wanting to grow this and if it turns out that you can't grow it um, remember that you can actually get some similar color combinations from uh, our native lobelia. Cultivars oh, of our yeah. native lobelia have sure. that dark blacky foliage with red flowers. So hopefully you'll be able to grow center stage red and enjoy it. But if not, see if you can find a, lo a lobelia, maybe a monarda, um, something like that that you can try out instead. Go back through uh, YouTube videos for the Gardening Simplified show. We took a summer garden tour, and uh, that was one of the plants you introduced to me, Stacy. And talk about gorgeous. I love Just it. Just beautiful. All right. Grace wrote us back when the wildfires were a big issue in many areas. She says, I do all container gardening. I've always tried very hard to water the soil and not the foliage which is great, water at the base. My question is, with all the smoke residue from the Canadian wildfires and the lack of rain, should I wet the foliage to clean uh, that residue off? I had to kind of chuckle when I read this question because I have some friends who uh, own a garden center in California. And uh, when they visited here in Grand Rapids, they took them for a ride to the airport and they noticed the snow brush in my car here in Michigan. They say, well, we have those in our cars in California too, but we use them to uh, dust the ash off the cars Oof. when Ouch. we leave work. Yes. I'll take snow. <laughs> when wildfires are taking place, I'll take snow uh, also. So what do you think about residue on foliage? Does it really block the the functionality of a plant? It really does. Okay. And I mean, maybe not to the point where the plant's going to just straight up die. But absolutely, you know, the, the chloroplasts in the plant cells that photosynthesize, dust, smoke particles, anything like that on the foliage, mold, you know, sooty mm -hmm. mold that happens sure. from aphids, anything that's obscuring those cells from direct contact with the sun will reduce the efficiency of photosynthesis. And in turn, the plant will make less energy because it's not as efficient uh, or quick at photosynthesis. Um, so again, it's not one of those things where you have to like stay up at night worrying about it. Um, but it is absolutely a good idea to um, break habit. And I'm glad that you, Grace, you're in the habit of not perpetually wetting your plants as a lot of people are. Um, but yeah, it's totally fine once in a while to just give it that shower, especially when we when there is wildflower or wildfire ash, especially when rain was very scarce as it was for us in May and June. Um, you know, doing that once in a while is absolutely no problem. It's it's basically like you're simulating rain. Yeah, it's a great explanation, Stacy. I the analogy that I'd put forth is uh, it's similar to 
powdery mildew on plants where when you get powdery mildew on the foliage, it's not going to kill the plant, but it certainly uh, weakens the plant and does not allow that process of photosynthesis to take place as uh, as needed. So. Right. It's like trying to eat all your food through a straw or something. Hmm. Like, yeah, you're getting nutrition, but you're just not like exactly. getting it the best that you can. I wonder if you could clean them off with a leaf blower. Didn't Course, someone ask that? Be and and we it. said, don't do that. Yeah. I think we, we actually featured that. Don't use a leaf blower <laughs> on your plants. You didn't want to aerosolize all of those particles. And besides, water will do the job without annoying your neighbors. There you go. <laughs> all right. Thank you very much. Anne writes to us, I live in zone 5B. Since holly berry is an evergreen, is it better to plant in spring or can they be planted in the fall, Stacy? Oh, you know, I am, and we've talked about this on the show, a huge fan of fall planting. It is so good for so many reasons. You know, as we were just talking about, the plant can uh, establish itself without having to sustain a bunch of growth on top. It can just put all of its energy into roots since it's sure. going dormant. The cooler temperatures, the more frequent rainfall, all of those things combined to make fall a really good planting time with a couple of exceptions. And one of those exceptions is definitely everything evergreens and particularly broadleaf evergreens like holly. So a broadleaf evergreen is a plant that's evergreen but doesn't have like needle foliage like a pine or a spruce or scale like foliage like an arborvitae or a juniper. So uh, broadleaf evergreens are things like rhododendron, laurel, um, pyrus, and of course holly. And so I absolutely do not recommend planting broadleaf evergreens in fall in cold climates. Uh, you know, that what happens is that even if you do it in early September and they have what is in theory a long enough time to grow roots, because you usually want to have at least six weeks of good root growth before winter starts for ideal fall planting conditions. Um, the difference is that broadleaf evergreens are going to lose water out of their foliage all winter long. Right. The winter sun is going to be beating on them, winter winds, and all of those things are causing the foliage to lose water all winter long. Now, if it does not have the benefit of a really good, robust root system to help it replenish that water anytime the soil is not frozen, then it's going to desiccate and die. And a lot of times, broadleaf evergreens are slower growing. You pay more for them. And you don't want to invest in something that is, is going to look genuinely awful. I'm sure anyone who's ever been to a city in, say, February and has seen those cafes try to plant beautiful boxwood planters, things like that, you, you've seen what can happen, and it is not pretty. Yeah, I agree with you 101%. Great explanation. I have done it. I have done it. I mean, when push comes to shovel, if you have to, you could move it, but you're going to have to coat it with an anti-desiccant. Right. You're going to have to mulch it well at the base. And yes, your odds are far lower than with a deciduous plant. So I agree with you right. 100%. And, you know, the anti-desiccant thing, it's, it's you know, it's, I'm glad that you mentioned that because if you're at your garden center, they might say, oh, yeah, I'll just spray it with this. Right. Um, and sure, if you could a smoke and hot deal on a plant and you want to mulch it and wilt proof it, then go for it. But just know that you it definitely is is much riskier than if you had planted it in spring. And mulch, of course as with most plantings, is very, very crucial. So similarly, Julie has a question. She asked, during our unusually harsh winter in USDA Zone 4 in Montana, both of my second season tater tot arborvitae died. Oh, no. I know. What can I do in the future to winter protect tater tot? Should I purchase and plant this fall or wait until spring? I love those little guys. They they have really become one of our most popular plants. Yeah. I don't know if it's the name or the plant or a combination of both. They're just so cute. They are very cute. They're just a, a little rounded evergreen. Yeah. They aren't tater tot shaped, but they're they're scaled like a, a tater tot size, like I guess. I don't Do you know. like tater tots? I mean they're okay. Yeah, me too. It's kind of a filler <laughs> thing. But the plant's great. But the plant is great. <laughs> so uh, as an arborvitae, that means that tater tot is a conifer. So that puts it in that needle-like or scale-like foliage that I was talking about. Now, these kinds of, uh, of evergreens are much better adapted to dealing with cold than broadleaf evergreens are. Broadleaf evergreens tend to come from milder climates, whereas the pine, the spruce, you know, they're basically made for a snow load. But that said, again, you, you still want that good root system in place mm -hmm. before they're going to be met 
you know, or, or confront all of those challenges, the winter sun, the winter wind, um, you know, frozen soil where they can't absorb any water. So the colder your climate, and certainly for Julie here in USDA Zone 4 in Montana, wow. I would recommend only spring planting of any evergreens. Um, definitely mulch, very important in climates like Nevada or like Montana, where it's, you know, can be very exposed and, and have a lot of winter sun. Um and the sooner you can get those in the ground and create those ideal root conditions with water, you know, f- some regular fertilizer through maybe about late July, that's all going to go into developing that root system to help it better withstand winter. I'm thinking of those uh, family holiday get togethers. You always see tater tots on top of casseroles, don't you? <laughs> Don't they kind of dress, you know, the, it's that and those dried onions. I love, I can never get green bean casserole. I love green bean casserole. And then you got to put a lot of those dried onions on it. Well, I love Sorry. onions all any, well, any way I can get them. But must be I'm just hungry right now. I, I guess you know, all that talking about tater tots really. Uh. <laughs> well, you know, the next question is also about eating. Oh, about okay. rabbits eating, not you eating. Oh, no. So Mags writes, I'm having quite a problem with rabbits, which have been eating absolutely all of my plants, it seems, other than grasses or evergreens. I spray, but it seems like it doesn't deter them for longer than a couple of days. Are there any plants you can recommend that are pretty rabbit resistant? Oh, that is so frustrating. They, you know, I'll build a little compound and somehow, some way they get in there and I don't know how they get in there. No, they're very, you know, they dig. They, they can do a lot of different things. They can squeeze through little fence holes, smoozes, as I know you're... Smoozes, uh, if you have, S-M-E-U-S-E. And, you know, if they're a little baby bunny, they can probably hop right through the hole of a chain link fence. Does not make me hoppy. But they're so cute. Yeah. Now, <laughs> you know, I'll tell you this past year uh, in one of my compounds that I built, uh, they went just after the beans like you wouldn't um. believe, the green beans. But they pretty much left everything else alone. Well, they had a favorite. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, so they just went for the beans. So I think that there's something to be said here for them uh, not liking certain types of plants. But I think it'd be, probably be pretty similar to the deer that, you know, things like allium, uh, mm-hmm. they're not going to like. Whereas tulips. Delicious city. Delicious. Right now, alliums are often on lists of uh, plants that rabbits don't eat. But I can tell you unequivocally, rabbits eat my allium sphericephalon every year. Not all of them. Yeah. Um, allium sphericephalon is the drumstick allium. So it, it comes up as just a single stem in about like early July. Um, long straight stem with a purple head on the top does look a bit like a drumstick. And those rabbits, it's like what they do. They come into the garden where I have them planted. They chow them down at the base they take one bite of it they say oh i forgot i hate this it tastes terrible and then they leave the flower you know welting in the garden now i didn't have a terrible year knock on wood this year but in previous years they have eaten my allium but my little guideline for choosing plants uh that rabbits will not eat without having to carry around a, a massive mental list in your head or on your phone, um, is fragrance. And we've talked about this right. a bit before. So plants that have any kind of resinous or strong aroma are generally avoided by rabbits. So that means things like lavender, any herbs. And, you know, may, maybe people think like, oh, well, I don't want a bunch of herbs. I'm trying to grow an ornamental garden. But a lot of herbs are very ornamental. I love, you know, you have with sage, you could have tricolor sage and have that variegation. You can have purple sage, which is really lovely. There's a bunch, of course, as you know, uh, ornamental oreganos that'll be very rabbit resistant. So while you're shopping, um, you know, in, and you're wondering if something will be rabbit resistant, you know, rub a leaf or break a leaf. Sure. And if it gives off that kind of like resiny, herbal fragrance, other examples, nepeta, lantana, perennial geranium, Agastache, then you know it's pretty much a good choice because rabbits don't really like that that fragrance. And mix those plants in with your other plants, and hopefully you can drive those rabbits over to your uh, your neighbor. But yeah, it is part of the mix. I mean, you know, you go back to that 
tater tot casserole example. I can't help it. I've got this on my <laughs> mind now. But like when you go to a dinner and it's all casserole, what do they call that? A potluck, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. A potluck. You know, I usually load up on the casserole like the uh, like the rabbit does uh, so that my plate is full and I'm not forced into taking some of that jello mold stuff because you feel guilty not taking a jello mold that somebody put the time into and I don't want it. All right. I just don't like it. And no one wants to so be the like first the person to cut into a jello mold anyway because it's so molded. I don't know what's in that thing. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings up the point there's always more room for jello and plants. Usually, yeah, you can you can I can usually find more room for plants, especially in spring before everything's grown in and then you think, "Oh my gosh, what did I do?" Um so, you know, uh, rabbits yeah. are tricky and I've had a pet rabbit and I've observed them eat, and what they do is like I was saying with the allium, they they cut plants at the base and then they chow down the stem that they that they just uh that they just removed. I have seen them stand on their hind legs to sample things that are a little bit higher, but generally that's how they work. So if they don't like something, they try it. They typically don't cause a lot of damage, but if they do like something, they'll just keep going until sure. that, that whole plant is gone. So, um, you, you know, and start looking at pepper sprays and that sort of, yeah. And the, the trick about sprays is they are effective, mm -hmm. but especially at the time where rabbits are most active in spring and summer, plants are growing pretty vigorously. And so they're going to outgrow whatever you sprayed and that new growth that the plant put on is going to be especially attractive to the rabbit because Ugh. it's so tender and juicy and succulent um so rabbits are <laughs> tough but you can definitely outsmart them uh look for things again that are fragrant also things that are very hairy like lamb's ear mm -hmm. pulmonaria lungwort has yep. like those hairs on it and uh foxglove which of course is not only hairy but also very toxic hair today gone tomorrow <laughs> H-A-R-E. I had to spell that one. <laughs> but you got my point. I, I got your point. Okay, thanks. It was a good one. Uh, Avelia. I hope I got your name right there. Avelia asks, I'm in zone 9B and looking for a hydrangea that has a pink-red bloom, similar to Quickfire or Limelight. Both of, this, uh, both of this varieties are zone 3 to 8. Okay. If I were to put one of these in my garden, will these perform and bloom accordingly? I read that if they do not get enough cold time, they may not bloom. So it's a great question, Avelia, and I'm glad that you asked it. Uh, so you said that if they don't get enough cold time, they may not bloom. Now, what you're talking about there is chilling hours. Uh, and there are plants that need a certain number of chilling hours or temperatures below 40 degrees Fahrenheit in order to properly develop their buds and bloom. So lilacs are the lilacs most famous are example. Great example yeah. But apples, pears, all of those cold climate fruits are also similar examples. Now, chilling hours are not what make uh, panicle hydrangeas difficult to grow in hot climates. They actually don't necessarily need those chilling hours. But the trick is that your climate is just so hot that they really struggle to grow well and, more importantly, to bloom well. So this is true if you live in a very humid climate, like uh, in the south of Florida, they really struggle in that intense of humidity. And it's also true if you live in a desert climate because they also struggle in that much sure. aridity. Sure. So some plants, you know, they can grow in, say, you know, Southern California where it's arid, but not humid climates like Miami. Some plants like this one, if it gets too hot, whether it's arid or humid, they can't. And one of the issues here is that the, the flower will develop and it will start to bloom, but in hot climates, first of all, this happens much earlier in the season. For us here in Michigan, panicle hydrangeas are pretty much at peak through like mid to late July. That means by the time that bloom starts to fade and age to pink or red, our nights are already getting a lot longer. Our temperatures are already starting to get cooler. And so we're able to see them undergo that really beautiful sure. color change that makes people like panicle hydrangeas so much. Whereas in warm climates, because the panicle hydrangea blooms are opening based on how much heat they've experienced, they experience that quantity of heat much earlier in the season. So say June, in you know, early June, instead of mid to late July. And that means that as those plants are starting to age their blooms, it is the height of your summer. It's the absolute hottest part of the mm. season. It's the longest possible nights. So what happens is the, 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 the hydrangea can't metabolize the pigments that make that color change happen because the nights are so hot, because the days are so hot. And so the flowers just turn brown. 
So very often you can grow them, but you just have to expect that that's not going that they're not going to develop that color. And Avelia, it sounds like that's exactly what she wants yeah. is those pink red blooms. Um, so, you know, I have to say I, I, you can try it, but you're just going to have to have reasonable expectations about what's going to happen. You will probably have better luck with big leaf hydrangeas or hydrangea macrophylla and something like Let's Dance Big Band, which has a really, really bright pink flower. And that will be pink. That one pretty much stays a nice pink or maybe a little bit lavender. Now, those tend to do well in hot, humid climates. Those are not going to be good desert plants, um, but you'll still be able to get some of that color. They're going to need shade you know, during the entire day, they're not going to be able to take a much sun, maybe a few hours in the morning. So you can't grow the panicle hydrangeas, but you should be okay with some of the big leaves. And, you know, whenever I talk to someone um, who is telling me they live in a hot climate and they wish that they could grow a lilac or a panicle hydrangea or, you know, fill in the blank, sure. I always try to, you know, tell them that, I really wish I could grow, you know, citrus and avocados and a bunch of really cool Australian natives bananas. and bananas. So, you know, I know it can be hard and we always want what we don't have. Um, but I think no matter what your climate is, there's always something you can be really excited about that you can grow that other people can't and really just feels at home in your climate and performs really well. Now, in that climate, also our friend that we interviewed from Florida a few weeks ago on the Gardening Simplified show said that uh, she. this is a garden designer, Teresa, who said she had a lot of success with oh-so-easy roses, oh, yeah. also buddleia in that zone. Uh, but Stacy, you know, I, I often say plants are like people and people are like plants. And there are plants that really do like the seasons changes. Yeah. You know? Yeah. They, you know, it all depends on where they're from. And right. we were talking about that not too long ago, too, is, you know, where is a plant from? That's really going to tell you about where it grows. But like we said at the beginning of this show, you should always take an experimental attitude. Learn everything you can. Take that into account when you make your decision about where you're going to plant it, how you're going to care for it. And, hey, you just might make uh, a new discovery and up and everybody's expectations of that plant. Sounds good. <laughs> All right. Paul is wondering, is diatomaceous earth safe for super tunias? I spray my super tunias with neem oil against bugs that eat the leaves, but it seems that the soil my petunias are in is infested with bugs. So would it be a good idea to put diatomaceous earth around the base of the petunias? Hmm. Interesting. Well, it's a great non-toxic control. Yep. Uh, it's not going to work on all insects, but uh, I think it's worth a shot if you're dealing with struggling with that. Problem. Right. Now, the great thing about diatomaceous earth, like Rick said, is it is non-toxic. So it is a powdery substance that is... Um, made of diatoms or prehistoric little creatures that have you it doesn't feel like anything to you if you were to touch it. it doesn't feel like fiberglass but to an insect crawling over it it does lacerate their exoskeletons and they dry out and die so um, when we talked to Bree Arthur who has a, a big vegetable garden down in North Carolina she was saying she uses this a lot as a, a pest control but two things you need to know about diatomaceous earth first of all it's important to understand that it does kill beneficial insects as well as as uh, pest insects, it's non-discriminating. Anything that crawls over it will get lacerated. And second of all, once it gets wet, all of its power to lacerate evaporates. It goes away. That seems to be a big problem. Yes. A deal breaker. <laughs> yeah. So um, now it's fine. You know, it's one thing if it's on top of the plant, on the foliage, but especially on the soil, I don't think that it's going to last long enough if you're trying to control insects that are active in the soil. I don't think it's going to last long enough to actually be effective. But I think you could try it on the top of the plant. Be careful about how you're watering. It's inexpensive. So it's not like, you know, if it gets wet every couple of you know, days or whatever that you're going to, you know, have to remortgage your house to keep using diatomaceous earth. It's, it's inexpensive, but um, you will have to keep applying it. And so I would say tr if you want to go ahead and try a non-toxic uh, method, keep it on top. But, you know, it's so important whether you're dealing with a pest or a disease issue is you have to try to get a proper ID so you can deal right. with it properly. And once you understand an animal's life cycle or a disease's life cycle, that gives you a lot more uh, ammunition of to think about how you're going to actually deal with it. So um, I would say, first of all, do find out what pests they are, if you can, and then make your strategy. And it can certainly involve diatomaceous earth, but I'd keep it on the plant 
rather than in the soil. You know, it's all part of IPM integrated pest management. And I would agree with you, uh, Stacy. we've got to identify exactly what this insect is. I've I've bypassed diatomaceous earth and used roofing shingles oh. uh, to deal with slugs. Oh, yeah, that'll work great. But the same kind of concept also. So. Oh, and one more thing. If you have a swimming pool, you are probably familiar with diatomaceous earth. It's often used in pool filters. Yes. But you cannot get the swimming pool grade diatomaceous earth to control insects. It's much finer. So it doesn't have the lacerating power as diatomaceous earth that's sold specifically for pest control. Great point. Kim writes to us, my son sent two star jasmine plants for my birthday. Happy birthday. What a great birthday present. I had admired the jasmine that he grows in Charleston. I'm in zone 7A, Nashville area. Question, should I go ahead and plant now or try to keep them in pots over winter? Is 7A too far north? Well, I can answer that one. Oh, yeah? What do you think? I wouldn't plant them in 7A. No? I don't think they're... I don't think they're going to make it. All right. What do you think? I think they could make it. Wow. Now. Take your shot. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, She already has the plants, um, but obviously they're special because they were a gift. And I think, you know, obviously, um, even though a new USDA hardiness zone map came out about, gosh, what is it now? About 10 years ago. um, I think that a lot of their, their conservative estimates. Right. And so typically I think Nashville does not maybe get as cold as 7A. It's just that it could get as cold as zone 7A. And I think that if uh, Kim has a protected spot, just like we were talking about earlier with the, the center stage crepe myrtle here in Michigan, if you have a courtyard, you know, very often this star jasmine is grown up a wall. Sure. And that really helps to provide some extra warmth, a microclimate like you were describing. So I would say base your decision on how good of a spot do you have outdoors to actually plant them in. And and you may have like the perfect area. Say you have like an enclosed brick wall courtyard. That'd be perfect. They would probably do just fine. But if you don't want to risk it because they were a gift, um, you can certainly overwinter them in containers. I would say do that in a uh, protected but exposed area. That Okay, that's contradictory. No, but, but it makes <laughs> sense. It makes, that makes perfect sense to me. I agree. You know, like if you have a screened-in porch right. um, or a glassed-in porch, they want, they're going to need some, some good sunlight. They're going to need good outdoor-like air circulation. And, of course, you're going to need to monitor them for water. Um, but that way they're not getting as exposed to, you know, the really harsh weather. Um, but they're also kind of like the outdoors. The other thing you can do is keep them in their containers and just keep a close eye on the weather and move those containers indoors when really bad weather threatens. Yeah. And the reason I mentioned what I did is having spent time in between Nashville and Atlanta, the big difference there from what we get, Stacy, is that it can get very, very cold in Atlanta or Nashville in the winter. There can be some extreme cold snaps. The big difference is up here, we have snow insulating the mm-hmm. plants. There, it's just plain cold. Right. Right? Yeah. And so you could lose uh, a plant like that. I agree with you. Looking for some microclimates uh, or maybe taking that enclosed porch approach uh, would be a good idea. Yeah. Or if they're not too big. Uh, moving them in and out as needed, as long as you keep a close eye on the weather, which honestly, most gardeners do. So, <laughs> <laughs> All right. Here's a question for you, Stacy. Timothy's asking, I hilled my potatoes one time. I meant to do it again, but time got away from me. Oh, he's a pro procrastinator a pro- <laughs> procrastinator procrastinator yeah what a, <laughs> boy that was bad i'm sorry timothy uh and i don't blame you we get busy what's the purpose of hilling i've read so they don't burn uh but thought it also promoted more potatoes on the vine that was above the ground so what so, do you think for tim what do i think i have tried hilling and it does not in my experience amount to a hill of beans okay next question <laughs> Um, so I know, you know what, you see this like on Pinterest and other places and you see like something where they've put a bunch of like soft new soil and then they pull it away and there's just this bonanza of potatoes underneath. That has not been my experience. Now, perhaps because I garden in very sandy soil and so it's maybe it's not necessary. Now, maybe if you have really clay soil, 
um, you will benefit. But I don't know. What do you think? I think uh, hilling is a good idea because as they grow, let's say you're growing them in a bucket. That's a fun thing to do too. Uh, but they continue to work their way up as they grow. And I think that's the primary purpose of, uh, of hilling is to keep just the proper cover over those potatoes so that those spuds can uh, produce properly. So I think you can go either way. Uh, probably technically, yes, hilling them as they grow is probably the, the best approach. Mm. But is it, uh, again, a deal breaker? Right. Not is necessary. it going to make such a huge difference? Right. So, Timothy, I would say don't beat yourself up over the lack of hilling this year. And if you are so inclined and perhaps have more time next season, you can maybe hill one potato, not hill another, and find out if it makes a difference. Yeah. There you go. No, you got to try it. Your question was spudtacular. <laughs> so Andrea writes, I am reaching out because I think Stacy mentioned in a recent episode that she uses rose fertilizer ah. on several of the perennials in her own garden. Assuming I heard correctly, can you give me a little more information? I have a big tub of rose fertilizer that I'd like to be able to use on my other perennials, but maybe there are some I should avoid. I love this question. Why is that? Because in the garden center or the greenhouse, anytime somebody would walk up to me and want to feed their macrophylla hydrangeas, I'd take them to the rose tone. Yep. And they're like, are you sure we can do this? I said, yeah, you have my permission. No, your hydrangea will turn into a rose. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Roses are flowering shrubs. And as such, a rose fertilizer is the perfect flowering shrub fertilizer. Yeah. But ultimately, I do think, even though I love the Espoma line and then a lot of them are very specific, you have, you know, palm tone and citrus tone, which of course we don't have here in Michigan. You have tree tone. Ultimately, you know, fertilizer is fertilizer. And if you're giving your plants nutrients and none of those numbers, the NPK ratio, the, the three numbers that are on every fertilizer uh, bag and container, if none of those are like way out of proportion to the other ones, I mean, some of it, you'll have a balanced fertilizer where all the numbers are the same. Sometimes you might get a little variation in between them, but as long as any of those numbers are not like way out of balance, which would indicate it's got a very specific purpose, I think fertilizers for the most part are pretty interchangeable when it comes to the garden. Well, I think you make a good point on the balance thing, because in this case also, um, if you were, Andrea, if you were to select a fertilizer that's high in that first number, nitrogen, uh, it will help stimulate a lot of green growth. But if you get something more balanced, and usually rose fertilizers are balanced. Pretty balanced, yeah. I think with confidence you could proceed. Yeah, and, and that means you don't have to have, you know, a whole pharmacy shelf of fertilizers right. in your garage. Exactly. And be inner, inner, you know, and oh, now I got to go get this one. Um, yeah, I find it's a good all-purpose fertilizer for any shrub or perennial, as is a spoma garden tone or as is a spoma plant tone. Um, and, you know, if you have fertilizer, then the good thing is to use it rather than to go buy a bunch of fertilizers and have a bunch of half-used fertilizers in your garage. <laughs> you know, I think it brings up a good point. I've had that experience in the garden center uh, and with potting soil uh, yeah. where they want a bag that has a picture. If they're growing vegetables, it's got to be vegetable soil and it has to say vegetable soil on the bag. And that's, that's really not the, uh, not the case. It is a a good marketing approach. And I'm sure that, you know, the intention is to make sure that the soil would be good and appropriate for your vegetables, but it doesn't mean you have to throw in the trowel if they happen to be out of vegetable soil. <laughs> right. And I just don't think I that get this off my chest <laughs> <laughs> that plants are as, are as picky or as needy yeah. um, as people might think. And just because there are specialty products out there, it doesn't mean that something else yeah. isn't equally as appropriate. There you go. You rose to the occasion. Uh, Christina asking, last spring and summer, I bought many proven winter shrubs in the quart size. Some are still very small planted in the landscape. I'm wondering if I should trim or pinch them all back to encourage branching. Or there are some that I should just let grow. And also, now, late August, is it a good time for pinching? Okay, so this is such a good question, Christina. And it's one that we get a lot because there are a number of online, uh, you won't find these in garden centers, but there are a number of websites, mail order garden centers, that sell these quart-sized plants. Now, these same quart-sized plants that, that they're selling 
are actually plants that we sell here at Spring Meadow Nursery, the company behind Proven Winners Color Choice Shrubs, to wholesale growers to pot up into larger containers and grow on into the one, two, three gallon that you buy at your garden center. So what they are really initially intended for is growing on in a container environment from a professional grower where they will then be trimmed two to three, sometimes even more times uh, as the as those growers raise them. So what happens is they get the liners or that, that one quart plant, they pot it up, they water it, it starts to flush out. Once that growth flushes out, they will give it a trim all over. And what that's going to do is cause everything to branch so you have twice as many branches. They're going to let that growth grow out. Then they're going to give it another trim. And now you've got four times as many branches. So usually two to three trims through a season. And that's how they develop that nice bushy look when you're actually in a garden center buying like a three gallon one. So with these little quarts, you have to be that grower. Exactly. You have to be the one to go in there and trim them. Now you don't have to, obviously the plant will grow, but the plant that you're going to get if you don't trim it is going to look a lot different than if you'd gone to the garden center and bought that three gallon. So a couple tips for this. I wouldn't recommend that you prune them now. It's obviously it's late in the season. Wait to do this till next spring. But no worries, it's not too late to, to work on developing that branching. Um, but you want to keep the cuts onto that thin, soft new growth. You want to avoid cutting into the, the actual wood of the plant because that's not going to uh, encourage that branching and that full lush growth. It's just going to leave a hole. Um, so keep it to, you know, when that new growth comes out and it's thin and easy to cut and, you know, do that two or three times next season through space throughout the year, depending on how much it grows, not throughout the year, but throughout the growing season, uh, base your timing on how much it's actually growing. And then after that, you should have a much, uh, happier plant. Yeah, you make a great point, Stacey. Uh, and in the industry, we would always call that upsizing. Mm. So we would upsize in the container. And then we within the container itself, we would coat the soil with Osmocote yeah. or fertilizer prills. And again, the whole intention is to have a good presentable product on the sales floor that uh, would cause people to sometimes buy impulsively. Ooh, we love that. But you're going to do <laughs> the work now upsizing this plant. So right. yeah, that's great. Yep. So it's not difficult, um, but it is something that you need to bear in mind that uh, you are, by getting that smaller plant, kind of, you are you're, you're taking the role of that of that professional grower. A pinch to grow an inch, even if it isn't <laughs> that plant's birthday. <laughs> That's right. All right. So uh, that was a lot, but I feel good that we've gotten caught up on some listener questions. Yeah. Again, if you have a question for us, we'll probably do future of these because it is important to us that we help okay. you um, answer your garden questions and resolve your garden issues. It's one of the ways that we simplify gardening here on the Gardening Simplified show. So we want to thank you for watching or listening however you prefer it. Thanks to Rick. Thanks to Adriana. And thanks to all of you. 